spend some time really thinking about what it is you want and why you want it, be honest with yourself. Not about what anybody expects from you, not about what the world expects from you or what they think, what you think the world or anyone else expects of you, but what you want, why you want it. And once you have clarity around that, then architect your life and your business to support those things and keep them visible and in front of you as reminders to always orient you back into that sweet spot when you inevitably stray. Yo, 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 this is the Streetwise Podcast. We're here to help you level up your game, level up your leadership, and level up your life. I'm your host, Matthew McReynolds. I'm a multi-brand franchisee, and I'm a franchise consultant where I help people find, launch, and build their ideal business. My main goal is to help you get off a zero and become the person that your dreams need you to be. Buckle up, get your popcorn ready, let's go. All right, yo, 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 this is Streetwise. I'm your host, Matthew McReynolds. Today we got Justin Meek on the podcast, EOS Implementer Extraordinaire. Justin, how you doing, man? What's up, man? Thanks for having me. I'm doing good. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah, I have, I really do appreciate you taking the time on a, on a holiday of all days. I don't know when this will actually drop, but this is January 1st, 2024. You got any uh you got any New Year's resolutions, man? What are you uh no, how are no you planning to kick off the New Year? No, I you know what? New Year's resolutions are just I'm a, I'm a fan of the process, right? Follow there the process go. and the outcomes will take care of itself. So I feel like people set themselves up for failure with res, with resolutions, put so much weight on it. It's just another day in the life, man. So follow the process, fall in love with the journey and uh, the outcomes will take care of themselves when you do the, the good stuff. Man, no, I love that. And I, uh, I agree. Why do you think that is? Why do you think uh, it's the, the concept of setting up a New Year's resolution is such a big deal at this time of this season, but then people have such a hard time sticking with it. What's the deal well, with that, man? It feels like a fresh start. And also I think people tend to indulge over the holidays. So, you know, they let work slide, they let fitness and nutrition slide. And so it's a reset and, you know, kind of a chance for some people to atone for, yeah. for some things that might leave them the, feeling a little sluggish by the time yeah. January 1st rolls around. Yeah, no doubt. Well, tell the people what it is that you do, what gets you up every day, and how you help people. We'll start there. Oh, yeah, I'm a certified EOS implementer. I'm a franchisee of EOS, which is nice. cool. And uh, I, uh, I use a very simple set of proven practical tools to help leadership teams, entrepreneurs run a better business and really get more of what they want out of their business. So I'm a business coach, I'm a teacher, and I'm a facilitator of, uh, of the EOS system, the entrepreneurial operating system. How did you find EOS? How did, you, how did it come into your life to the point where oh, I got to help implement this with other people? So I first got turned on to EOS by a, a franchisor, actually, that runs EOS. They were a client of mine when I was at a digital marketing agency. And uh, Gino Wickman, the author of the book Traction, which introduced EOS to the world, is their implementer still to this day. So holy cow! Yeah, yeah, he's one of the few businesses that he uh, he still, I believe, still still actively implements for. So, and I knew they were a fantastic business, very successful, super great culture, just growing like uh, growing like nobody's business. And so I, I read the book and was like, oh my god. Like, where has this been all my life? There are, you know, <laughs> what, what, what appealed to me about it was it's not rah-rah, it's not motivational or philosophical, it's not theory, it's all practical tools to deploy in the business to help you run a better business and create more simplicity, clarity, accountability, and focus. And so um, armed with that, I, when I joined a, a, a little startup agency uh, as my next move, I did so under the condition that we run the business on EOS. I really just, I, I just wanted to do it. I felt, I believed in it. And um, the owner of that business and CEO read it and was like, yeah, this is great. Let's do it. And, and so a little 15 person agency and we deployed EOS it took us about six months to really cool. stitch it into the fabric of how we, how we operated, really how we moved, lived, ate and breathed in the business. And over that time frame. 
our revenue velocity almost doubled and uh, we created a work-life balance company value that capped employee hours at 40 a week. And so people who had been working like 60, 70 hours down to work 40 hours a week while our revenue had almost doubled. Wow. So that was a transformative experience for me. I ended up just being a voracious, you know, EOS evangelist. Then I found out there was this thing called an implementer. Then I found out it was a franchise and franchise is kind of my tribe. And, and yeah. that was all she wrote, man. For me, it was like a profession, it's a professional calling and, you know, best thing I've ever done in my career. Oh, that's really cool, man. So uh, just real quick, just a question about that backstory. When you guys were, you, your team, the, the members on the team actually worked less, but revenue and productivity went up. What, what was the, I mean, I know you attribute it to EOS, but specifically you're not necessarily adding more people to the team or were you, or was it just people were working more efficiently? More efficiently, more focus, more alignment more time spent doing the things that mattered versus activity, right? mm. visibility into what mattered, alignment into what mattered, focus on what mattered. It's, you know, like every startup, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, especially in startups have a, like a muscle memory where we just throw more stuff on the mix. Yeah. And then you yeah, end up no taking this ball of energy and going an inch in a million directions. And what, what EOS allowed us to do is take that same energy and channel it like a laser beam to cut through, you know, cut through diamond versus, you know, dispersing. That was really, that was really it. Oh, that's awesome. Was there, was it hard for you when you first pivoted from working in this agency to then becoming an actual implementer where now essentially you're a franchisee, you're operating a business are we, were you, you're essentially like a solopreneur in the sense of yeah. like, you're, you're working for yourself by yourself. What was that transition like for you kind of mentally as you pivoted from one thing to the other? Good question. It was a lot of work and, and hard, but when I look back at the journey, it doesn't seem like a lot of work because mm. it was fun. Yeah. Uh, okay. And I've been an entrepreneur throughout my career. I've co-founded businesses. I've been a, a leader at startups, but, uh, for those who are familiar with Traction or EOS, you'll be familiar with the whole visionary integrator relationship. And I am a, a textbook visionary, which was one of the things that really appealed to me when I first read Traction was I, I realized it was the first thing that had articulated that it's okay to be a creative problem solver, strategic thinker, forest through the trees, idea kind of person, and not want the responsibility and account of, uh, have, of having to manage people. And holding, holding them accountable and being in the minutia, not only is it okay, but in fact, you should lean into that as a skill set because that's where you contribute to yeah. whatever business you're a part of at your highest level. Come it's on. also what keeps your cup full and your energy and enthusiasm high. So for me, yeah, you have to do a lot of minutia and grunt work when you're starting a business because you are doing everything. But for me, there was a vision that I got to pursue and I saw, I, ha I had an envisioned future and I was building it. So for me, it was just fun. I was learning a lot and meeting people in the community. And like, it was just like a, a fun ride. And you know, you're doing the right thing when you're having fun and it doesn't feel like work, even though you're working hard, that's like a good, good sign. Oh, that's beautiful, man. What about from the, the family side? Was there anything with the, uh, I mean, were you married with the kids at the time? Uh, okay, so kind of like walk me through what that transition was like with the wife and kind of explaining, I got to do this now. This is where my heart's at. Well, I'm I'm blessed with a uh, a very supportive and understanding <laughs> spouse <laughs> that who, helps. Uh, who has been through my you know I'm I'm the type I leap before I look and when I believe in something I just like I'm all in. It's like all my chips in, and she kind of knows it's. I don't know if futile is the word when I'm like, when I'm, I'm fully committed, I get the blinders on, but super supportive. Um, you know, I, part of the, the, the motivation to do this was because I've had some chronic health issues. I got really sick about 12 years ago. I, I got Epstein-Barr virus or mono for those who are familiar with that kind of thing. It's, it's, uh, and then getting COVID like brought up a bunch of chronic stuff that, that, uh, that had oh, been wow. sort of taken care of for a while. So I was like really sick, man. And, and part of the reason why I wanted to 
start this thing was because I could control my own energy. And, you know, as hard as I wanted and needed to work, I could also carve out time where I wasn't beholden to anybody but myself. And I could step away and rest and reju rejuvenate, recuperate, spend time with my family. And so I think because of the fact that I was doing that, even in the throes of starting the business, I was still carving out, protecting time to rest and be with my family. My wife was very supportive of that because she was getting more of me actually than, than she had in the past. Man, and it's such a true testament to, I think, entrepreneurship in general. Like most entrepreneurs, they get caught up in the the grind and pulling out every ounce of juice that they possibly have that we end up just running ourselves so dry. So for you to be able to make a pivot in that time that you physically, your body needed it, that's that's really special, man. Um, yeah, man. I, you know, it's, you make a really good point. Uh, so many entrepreneurs start their own thing because they want to be in control. Right. They want, they want to have the full, you know, total agency over their future and their, their income and their professional lives and their personal lives too. But a lot of times what ends up happening is the business ends up in control of them. And, you know, luckily for me, I was armed with EOS and EOS in large part helps leaders get back in control of their business. I mean, the book's called Traction, Get a Grip on Your Business, and it's called that for a reason. Um, it helps leaders elevate and de delegate and elevate, become real leaders in the business so they can, you know, they can live the life they want without having to be so deep into the trenches all the time. So I, I came into this armed and equipped with EOS as a toolkit, and I'm a little older, right? I've been through this before. I've been through the startup thing, you know, and so I had the wherewithal to not let myself get sucked in. So I was able to build a sustainable growing business while maintaining the, <clears throat> excuse me, maintaining the kind of life that, that I wanted to live and always staying in control. How, how did EOS, um, how does it specifically help business owners? And I mean, you are so interesting because you were able to, you were on the business owner and you were on the, you know, the entrepreneur side of, getting EOS implemented within the business. And then now you're on the other side where you are the one that actually gets to go in and implement EOS and help entrepreneurs. So what specific tools would you say are pivotal in the beginning that people like the low hanging fruit, I guess is what I'm asking for that most people are missing when they're running their business. Yeah. I mean, if, if you had to boil EOS down to its, its essence, EOS really helps leaders and ultimately the entire company get aligned <clears throat> i got a little new year's eve uh flu going on <laughs> so we what we get for, for <laughs> in this on a holiday <laughs> um vision traction and healthy so aligning the leadership team on exactly where the company's going and how you're going to get there together and there are all tools that provide a common context and a framework and a language to help get create that that shared sort of uh uh, toolkit that everybody works within, right? So uh, traction from the standpoint of making sure that there's accountability and discipline. Everybody's moving mm -hmm. in the same direction towards the achievement of that vision. And healthy is just creating teams that that are awesome at smoking out root problems and solving them forever, that really are open and honest and vulnerable with each, with each other, kind of that championship locker room mentality where there's no finger pointing. There's no blame. There's no politics. It's just how do we get better? Because a lot of times leadership teams are just not cohesive. So mm. ultimately, when the leadership team gets really good at using these tools, they understand the why and the what. And they are equipped to teach it down into their organization. You've got teams top to bottom that all understand the vision, that believe in the same things and want to be on that journey together. You've got all the human energy in the company harnessed. So all the arrows are pointing in one direction making progress every day, every week, every quarter, every year. And you just got teams that enjoy being around each other and that are all right people in the right seat and are, you know, kick ass at solving problems together. Man, that right people, right seat is huge. I, so just, uh, you know, this and my audience knows this, but I, I took a deep dive into EOS last summer after my youngest daughter was born and I had to take some time off and I, I came across 
EOS. I actually bought the book Traction back in 2020 and it sat on my bookshelf for I, for two years. I just I wasn't ready for the book. I opened it. I started flipping through it. I was like, oh, this, this is a little high level for me. And it was when I was taking that time off and I needed the break physically. And by the grace of God, I just so happened to was physically forced to take that time off. And I was listening to a podcast, Eric Van Horn, and he was always talking about uh, traction and rocket fuel. And you were on that one of the episodes and you were one of the first uh, Franchise Secrets podcast episodes that I listened to and just listening to you talk. Yeah. And I went back to rocket fuel and it was that understanding the difference between the visionary and the integrator. And I went back and forth and realized that I am without a doubt a visionary, but I was sitting in the integrator seat and I was tripping myself up yeah. and I was frustrating myself, frustrating my business. I also had a lot of key players that were phenomenal on the team, but from a cultural perspective, they might have been doing things that were toxic, not knowing it, but also there's just there was just a lot within my business that I didn't realize was happening until I was able to have the actual tools, like yeah. clear cut core values, uh, the people analyzer, you know, all those things. And so EOS has been huge for for us, man. Yo, 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 thanks for listening this far. It's at this point in the episode that I want to talk about Streetwise Franchising, teaching, training, building, Streetwise Franchise. As a franchise consultant, it's my job, it's my absolute pleasure, and it's my mission to help aspiring entrepreneurs find, launch, and build their ideal business. I've been a franchise owner for almost a decade. I know what it means to struggle. I know what it means to build a team. If you're ready to get off a of zero, if you're ready to build something for yourself, visit streetwisefranchising.com. Let's get the conversation started. Don't wait until tomorrow to build your future. It starts today. Streetwise Franchising. Stay humble, stay hungry, stay streetwise. Let's get back to the episode. What's your like what's your favorite type of business to go into when you know you're coming in and you're you're helping a team out like a new client? Who do you who do you like really look for? That's a great question. I um, first of all, that's cool. I didn't know that that I was one of the first podcasts you heard on. Oh yeah, podcast. man. I thought that's I told cool. you that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um and I, I, and it's awesome that EOS has had such a positive impact for your business. Really happy to hear that. Um you know, I work with a lot of franchises. Uh, platform companies, uh, franchisors, uh, the IFA was a client for a time, um, which was cool to kind of get an inside look at at at, at the trade association world. But wow. beyond all that, what, what's most important is that for me, I love working with teams that are ready to grow and know that they need help and have the, the vulnerability to, to look at things in a different way and be open with with new perspectives, new ideas, and don't have so much ego that they, that they, that they close off to that. Right. I always say like, you know, teams need to you know, fight like you're right and listen like you're wrong. Mm. Right? Turn down the judge, turn up the curiosity and teams like that, where I'm pretty hard in a room, but when I'm, when I have my coach hat on, I treat my clients like my coaches, my best coaches in my athletic career treated me, which is, I believe in you. I want you to be world class, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold you accountable to step up and perform. And so the teams that can take me, like I, I try to get to the no as quick as possible with the new client, saying, look, this is not gonna be easy, and you gotta grit your teeth and know that I'm coming at you from a place of like love, care, and, and wanting you to be the best. And if you, can, if you can do that in the room and you can step into that room knowing that and be comfortable with being uncomfortable, we're gonna have a great journey. And the clients that really embrace that, it's awesome. Like those rooms are fun. That's gotta be, uh, it's gotta be there though. Like they gotta be ready to be vulnerable. They gotta be ready to check the ego. I mean, if their ego is is stuck in themselves and being right, I mean, there's no. You're just gonna frustrate them to the point of 
not actually growing versus, you know, there's, there's frustration that leads us to growth and that kicks us in the tail and gets going, but you got to have your ego in the right spot. Sometimes leaders get more than what they bargained for with you. <laughs> what do you mean thinking, by that? Well, they're thinking we're just going to get a set of tools we can use, but then it becomes like, we start to dive deep and start oh. to uncover some of the pain in that team, whether it's people issues or leadership issues. And, and we, we go deep. And, uh, you know, leaders who aren't ready for it or are not, have not been accountable or have been playing politics, they get smoked out and exposed. What does that look like when a leader gets, I mean, you say leader, it's not necessarily like the head of the team. I mean, it could be, but typically you're meeting with the leadership of an organization, right? Like, what does that look like when somebody gets smoked out? Uh, some tears sometimes. Some uncomfortable <laughs> conversations. Usually yeah. what happens is we're just ripping a Band-Aid off or mm. we're, you know, and exposing a gaping wound where there had been a, you know, a little Band-Aid, right? And we solve it at its root. And so, you know, 99 times out of 100, that team will end up in a much better place because they deal with pain that should have been dealt with a long time ago that has been sort of growing roots like a tree under the system, right? And it's harder to remove when it gets really entrenched. So we go there and excavate and uh, more often than not, it's good for the, definitely what's in the best interest of the company. Cause that's my concern. Uh, it's also what's typically in the best interest of all the leaders. So once they can get past ego, which is tough to get past, then they can really think about what's in everyone's collective best interest. And uh, when the dust clears, people are typically like that. We needed that. We had to go through that. And in, in a lot of cases, it had been sitting there for way too long. So, uh, and when, when teams really step up and embrace that, it's, it's a gratifying, fulfilling experience for everybody because they really take steps forward. Um, when teams resist that, then it's, you know, more often than not, I'd rather just say, this is not for you. And, you know, we'll part as friends. That's really good. What got you into the franchising world. I mean, I know EOS is a franchise in and of itself, but you know, we've been able to connect on multiple levels. Again, the first one was the Franchise Secrets podcast when I heard of you. And the second, uh, when I was at Horsepower Academy, they're learning our, they're getting la ready to launch our new brand. And here you are showing up and, and doing the implementation for the entire, the entire academy that was there. How did you get into the franchising world and kind of explain that journey to me? Yeah, that was fun too. And we uh, we ended up having some beers at the airport. And yeah, we did. Got to hang out. It was cool. Um, yeah. So I, in 2007, I started working at this digital agency doing local pay per click called Reach Local, which is still around to this day. Reach uh, they, Local. They've, they've, they've I know Reach acquired. Local. Yeah, and and um, we were one of the first agencies to to take a, kind of a yellow pages feet on the street sales model to selling Google AdWords to local businesses. This was a time where you could call up, you know, somebody doing power washing in Dallas and say, Hey, did you know there were 50,000 people searching for power washers in Dallas last month on Google? Are you in front of them? And more often than not, somebody would reply, um, I don't know about this interwebs thing. I got a, <laughs> I got a double truck in the yellow pages, so I'm good. Um, so wow. early. And, uh, I ended up, having a lot of success as one of the first people there selling to national brands directly because it was more of like a partner white labeled technology model and uh, and then got promoted and moved down to Dallas from where I'm from, which is the Washington DC area to run the franchise team, which was kind of our version of enterprise, right? Like a franchise with a hundred, 200,000 units where we take a local fee pay-per-click model and have one program where we deploy a thousand hyper-local campaigns with different budgets across Google. So that's how I got into franchising and I got to know it. And as you know, the franchise community is tight. You get to know people and you form relationships. And what's cool about franchising is it's not like another industry where a bunch of people in the same vertical get together and they all want to protect trade secrets, right? When you're in a franchise conference, there's a restaurant and a, and a home services and a spa and ever, so everyone talks and shares openly because it's, it's a model, not a vertical or business. So that creates this tight knit community that I just became a part of and grew with and 
you know, once you're in, you're, you're in and it, you know, and it's fun. And then, you know, and then it's, then it becomes just a good time and, and, uh, and, and you can just grow within the industry. So specifically with horsepower, I mean, those guys, did you meet the, did you meet them at a conference? How long have you been implementing with, with the team there and how has that been going for you? Yeah. Horsepower is awesome. They're a great client, great partner. Um, those guys are, as you know, like doing things the right way and aggressive about growing and, and growing together with their franchisees and somebody at, at the IFA conference in 2020, uh, I had just become an implementer said, you know, you, you should talk to these guys. They, uh, they run EOS, they believe in EOS. And so I, I just, I, 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 I cold, uh, approached Josh, the visionary founder and said, Hey, nice. our mutual friend told me to talk to you. And he's like, yeah, call Zach. He, he's in charge of EOS. So Zach, uh, Zach's not the other co-founder and Josh. And we just started chatting about how we can support franchisees through EOS. And we ended up creating this whole model that had never been, uh, deployed before around which now has gained popularity within EOS as a community about how a franchisor like Horsepower can support in an organized capacity the franchisees with EOS without having to require every franchisee to hire somebody directly like me. Because that's just cost prohibitive, especially when you first open your doors for business. So 100%. we created a whole new framework, a whole new methodology, and now I do a pure implementation for the executive team. I implement for one of their internal brands and we do the, the franchisee training. So they're, they're an awesome partner. Yeah, it's really cool. That was something that actually drew me to horsepower was in all of their marketing to franchisee candidates was that they operate on EOS that they highly encourage. I mean, when I signed, when I signed the, the franchise agreement, they sent me a copy of traction and I think rocket fuel, which I already had a copy of. So I was able to stack up in my library, but um, yeah, really cool, super solid tool set for new entrepreneurs to uh, build their business around. Um, I wanted to, when I having you on, I wanted to talk about some, tools, some things yeah. that, you know, people that are uh, maybe looking to start a business, looking to get into franchising, or maybe they've been operating for um, for a few years or a few years to 20 years. I mean, who knows? What are some key things when you first start getting in? I mean, we talked about talked about where the ego of the leadership is, how, how open and vulnerable is the team going to be, but from a like practical um, day-to-day -day kind of process, what are things that most entrepreneurs are missing when they're going about running their business? They don't have tools, right? It's just kind of throwing up spaghetti on the wall and seeing what sticks. And it's, it's very chaotic. And uh, a friend of mine recently in the franchise space recently told me about another friend of his who runs EOS within her business who said, when you're, when you're young and starting out and you have just a few people, it's a jazz band, right? You can be, you can sort of riff and be extemporaneous and like be creative. And, yeah. and when you start to grow and get more and more people, you need to become a marching band, right? Where everyone's moving in the same direction. You can't have a hundred person jazz band because it's just been a bunch of noise. So I think what happens is that early success that a lot of entrepreneurs have when they can just get in there every day and fly by the seat of their pants. They don't have a framework. They don't have tools that can scale with the business. So they end up creating this, there's this complexity model. When you have two people in an organization, there's two lines of communication. You add a, a third person, you've just increased the number of people by 50%, right? Two to three, you've increased complexity by 200%. Two, two lines of communication to six. Right. And you just keep adding on more people four people. You've just doubled in size, but now you have a 500% increase in complexity because you have 12 lines of communication. Wow. So entrepreneurs are so close to that mirror. They don't see that like evolving amoeba growing, growing complexity every time they add another person, but the business starts to feel it. So when you have these two, like, that's why I always say it's never too early to create a set of tools so you can grow in the right way. The way you use the tools will evolve. But having those tools as a foundation helps you grow and scale in a sustainable way. And most entrepreneurs just don't have that. Mm. Do you think there's a balance though? I mean, there's so many people 
that start their business out of like in the e-myth, it talks about like they have that entrepreneurial seizure and they're the technician because they're like, so many people are passionate about the widget, you know, it's their craft versus somebody who wants to set it up specifically as this organization where they're the pure entrepreneur from the very beginning. Like, do you think there's a balance there when it comes to um, creating these systems? There absolutely is a balance and there's a lot of room to be creative. And it's funny when I hear people say, Oh, EOS is rigid. There's it's too rigid. I mean, that's bullshit. Like <laughs> it's you're you're too rigid, actually, if you think that. Maybe that's some projection. <laughs> because yeah. like, I don't know, you heard me use this analogy in uh in our training at, at in Nebraska and horsepower. For those basketball fans out there, that's I, I, I compare EOS to the triangle offense of business management, right? Jordan, when he was in the eighties, dominated in the league, coached by Doug Collins. When he, when Phil Jackson and Tex winners came in, he was really, Jordan was very suspicious because he was a creative genius, right? The guy was an artist and scoring, you know, winning the league scoring titles. And he knew that there was this really structured offense that was going to come in called the, the triangle. And so he was worried about it, kind of putting a chokehold on his innovation and, and putting, you know, putting a, a, a ceiling on his, his creativity. But what ended up happening was it created a framework that unleashed his innovation, his entrepreneurial spirit, if you want to call it that. <clears throat> Aligned all the team members, created accountability for everyone's roles and channeled all of them in a direction to win six championships and create a dynasty. And so within the EOS framework, it's just a simple set of tools that provides common language and shared context and puts everybody on the same page. And there is a huge opportunity to be creative, innovative. It actually unleashes your entrepreneurial spirit because you don't have to worry about all the minutia and all the bullshit. And how do I, how am I going to hold this person accountable and do this review and create this kind of like, uh, clarity and share the vision. It just takes care of all that for you. It kind of dummy proofs the business and allows you to be true, express who you are as an entrepreneur. What a great analogy. Uh, that's uh, it's a great point. Cause I think that's, that's when they started winning the more, the, that's when they started winning their championships was under that framework. And when they truly became unstoppable, a lot of entrepreneurs will say or believe or operate under the assumption that, listen, I'm hiring adults. I don't want to micromanage people. I'm hiring individuals, especially when building up a leadership team. Like I shouldn't have to hold your hand, but how important is managing your managers and how important is accountability when you're truly trying to build out a leadership team? Crucial. Like the moment, as Doug, uh, uh, Jim Collins says, D I said Doug Collins, I was th still thinking the Bulls and Jordan. As Jim <laughs> Collins says, the minute you have to tightly manage someone, you've made a hiring mistake. Right? Mm. Leaders create, point the direction, set very crystal clear expectations about what it means to be a right person in the right seat. What does accountability mean? What is accountability? What are the consequences of accountability? Meaning accountability is just a buzzword unless there are consequences. Accountability means there are t there's teeth in the organization. And if people don't live up to performance standards that are objective and crystal clear, there's consequences for that. So great leaders communicate clearly, point the direction about what it means to win clearly describe what accountability means and looks like, and then hands off, finds people who truly are the right people who get it. They want it. They have the capacity to do, to do it within the seat in their organization that they occupy. And then they create the space and they empower. They do not enable. Right? A lot of leaders mm. have the, have the, the, uh, Sort of, it's a double-edged sword, man, because a lot of what contributes to entrepreneur success also ends up coming back to bite you because very can do, very like I, I very capable, very competent, uh, very fast-paced. 
And so a lot of leaders will, will somebody will come into your office and say, I need help. And they're like, I'll just do it. Just give it to me. I'll do it. I, I'll just, because you don't get it. And it's, uh, uh, and your employees love that, right? Because you're up till midnight now cranking on a new project. They're home having a beer and just hanging you know, out. They don't have to worry about it anymore. They're getting sleep. So, you know, leaders need to say, I don't know. How would you solve it? Ooh. And what can I do when you tell me, when you think about that and when you come have an answer, tell me how I can support you. So it's, it's all about empowerment, not enablement. And, and I think that's a subtle but super, super important distinction that a lot of entrepreneurs get tied up on. Yeah. And then on the flip side, too, one of the things I wanted to ask you, because uh, a very strong theme in, in all of EOS is delegate to elevate. And uh, I, I wanted to ask you specifically the difference that you see between delegation and abdication of uh, responsibilities and roles. And where do, where do leaders miss the mark when it comes to delegating versus abdicating tasks and responsibilities? Well, um, you know, I, I don't want to get too deep into the toolkit because I, I don't want to start going into uh, tools that your audience might not be familiar with because then I'll cool. be speaking Greek, but <laughs> a, a foundational tool within the US called the accountability chart. And it looks like an org chart, but it's not because we don't care about titles and we don't, we remove faces from functions. We remove titles. All we care about is what someone does in the business, what they're responsible for. And when we create this with the team, we remove the faces from the functions, right? Everybody step out of your ego, step out of your history, step out of your, 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 uh, your title and what functions departments and the seats that support that department are required to inject accountability, clarity, simplicity in an organization. So when a team aligns on what the seats look like, what the departments look like, the roles that each seat is responsible for and accountable for, then it becomes crystal clear and the entire organization is aligned on who is responsible for what. Um, and then real leaders in the organization make sure that they own the things that allow them to be strategic, allow them to be, to be problem solvers, to really be visionaries for those, for those people who step into that seat, right? Or integrators for those people who can orchestrate and harmonize all the moving parts and pieces of business. And then within their organization, there, there are seats where it's all about execution. So it's just crystal clear using that tool as the foundation to scale on that clarity. And I know I, 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 I'm trying to walk a fine line between going too deep into the tool and keeping it high level. So apologies if this is confusing to anybody, but once that tool is created, then it's clear about whether or not you're, like you said, delegating or abdicating your responsibility because everyone knows who's responsible for what. Sure. And yeah, no, I appreciate, I appreciate that. And I should have um, maybe prepped you a little bit better with uh, like what I wanted to do with this episode. So I, I actually talk quite a bit on EOS kind of throughout all of, all of this show. And I love bringing on somebody like you because as as much as you're like willing and open, man, like let the floodgates go because it, it's one of those things that you know when you kind of get into a a movie that or a book that has like a different dialect. And in the yeah. beginning, maybe you're watching the show that was made in the UK, and in the beginning, you know you don't really get what they're talking about. But by season six, you catch yourself speaking the same <laughs> the same slang that they are. Like that's, that's the way that I want my audience to slowly grow with. I mean, I had Jeff Schaefer on here, uh, episode, I think five, I think this is, we're in the forties now, but, um, but yeah, man, I appreciate you, um, just kind of keeping it at a, at a, at a high level, but also like getting into it. Um, great analysis about the, uh, the, the, the TV show. <laughs> like, <that's, that's, laughs> my sense. wife and I just finished slow horses, man, on, uh, Apple I TV. Check that out. That's on my it's list. It's good. On my list. I highly recommend it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it's good stuff, man. Cause I, selfishly, I mean, I got, I got these questions too, that I, you know, I'm trying to figure out for myself. I mean, probably the biggest thing was the difference between the visionary and the integrator. And last you met my general manager, Russell, yeah. uh, at the airport and at Academy back in July. And getting him on board was 
one of the biggest things that and biggest level ups that we've ever done. Um, I had to sacrifice a lot though, from an ego perspective, because I mean, I had to like turn the team over to him and I had to pull myself out because I was the one leading the the morning meetings. I was the one kind of rah, rah every single day, get them in, get them out the door. But it was important to have him feel like it was truly his team as the integrator and for the team to see like they can't just cut the rules and come talk to Matthew because Matthew's going to feel some type of way and, and motivate me and maybe let some things slide that somebody who's a real integrator who's focused on details might not uh, might not necessarily uh, allow. I mean, how important is it for entrepreneurs and leaders? I mean, I just told my story, but from what you've seen to like take the crystallizer assessment and take other assessments to truly know where you fall and what your strengths are. Yeah, good question. Well, I mean, I'm sure not just ego, but also just letting go of the vine and and, and seeing mm. that control to someone else. It's your baby, right? Yeah. So, to like step away and let somebody else kind of in in a lot of cases the integrator really owns the P&L and takes that away from the visionary. That's that's courage, man. And that 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 takes some like real trust that you have the right person in the right seat. So, yeah, that's that's tough. That's really tough. But it's the only way to scale. It's the only way to create the kind of sustainable energy for yourself where you can contribute at your highest level for the long term, right? And not burn yourself out um, and not end up hating the business and hating your life, right? Um, delegate and elevate is a super crucial exercise as a, an assessment tool. Have you, have you done that? I'm all right, this is it. I'm going to hold your feet to the fire. Have you done the del delegate and elevate exercise? Walk me through the delegate and elevate like – what is the actual exercise itself? Okay, and then I'll tell you how I, yeah. If, if you get one thing out of today's podcast, go to Google, type in EOS, delegate and elevate, and you'll, you'll find a PDF. That PDF has four quadrants. Starting off the exercise, write down on another piece of paper, print, out, print this out, and write down everything you do in the business, all the mm. things you do. Big, little, and everything in between going to be a list of probably like 20, 30, maybe different things. And then once you have that full accounting, you start moving over each one of those things into one of the four quadrants in this tool. It's a one page PDF. Things you love to do and are great at doing. That's when you're in your flow state, right? That's when you're like loving life and happy, you know, just like I'm doing the, I'm, I'm here on earth doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Then you move everything in the, the like and good at top right. So top left, love great. Top right, like good. Mm, That's when you're, yeah, still, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're still flowing. Then bottom left, don't like to do and good at doing. That's where professionals go to die. Because that's the stuff that Ooh. you're taking from your employees. You don't trust them. You don't really like it. You probably hate it. It's a grind. It's kind of soul crushing, but you're good at it. Nobody else can do it. I don't have anybody who gets it like I am. I'm just going to take, I'm, you know, I'm going to bear this burden. And then this, the bottom right, the things that you don't like to do and are not good at doing. And then you start to determine, all right, where am I at my best? Where am I contributing at my highest? And what you can also do is color code all of the things that have to do with managing people. Oh, that's so good. You can say, oh, shit. All the things that have to do with managing people are in the bottom left. I should not be managing people. Wow. Like, then you start to see, am I really in a position where I can lead, manage, and hold people accountable? Or should I be a producer? Would I be, would be happier contributing or as the visionary? And then the goal is, over time, all those things in the bottom two quadrants, don't like, not good at, don't like, and good at, you, you delegate it, you automate it, you outsource you hire or you just delete it, throw it in the trash can if it's not out. Mm -hmm. And you take a deliberate approach, maybe once a quarter, you pick one of those and make it a, a rock for those who are familiar with that terminology to get that thing off your plate. So that over the course of a year, two years, three years, you are ultimately spending all your time and energy in those top two quadrants. That's it. That's good. And yes, I have done a version of this, but it is extremely outdated. 
and that's I can't think of a better thing to start the start the new year than to go through this myself, but also have all my leaders go through this as as well. Um, oh, good stuff, man. Good stuff. I'm curious about like you, and uh, I mean, I know you you've you understand this stuff so fluidly, but um. So for context on the question, you know, I've got my businesses, but I also just started as a franchise consultant with Franchise and I'm figuring out how to rebrand, make my own brand, you know, streetwise franchising and do this whole thing with the podcast and with my content. But the the productivity aspect of kind of locking in every day in a new venture like this, it's got to be I feel like it's a little bit similar to you as an EOS implementer in gaining clients, in prospecting, in lead gen, how how is that process for you? I mean, does EOS, did they initially help you generate leads? Was that something you had to do completely on your own? Uh, I was just curious in that, like how, I I mean, I'm new to this and it's hard. It's uh, hard. <laughs> it's what, it's I know what LinkedIn, you're big on LinkedIn and, and I'm sure that's helped you. But yeah, man, I just want to kind of lay that on a platter and, and see what you say. Yeah, I mean, it's what most implementers struggle the most with, which is building a book of clients and good clients. Yeah. You know, what makes for a great implementer? Great clients. Mm. So building a book of great clients, it's tough, man. And there's a warm lead program with EOS, but in my two years as an implementer, two, two plus, I've gotten one warm lead that has been really qualified and converted. Wow. Now it's time for me to get to know EOS and then get to know me about what the right fit is. Uh, it was multi-unit franchisee that we just started uh, last month. Nice. Uh, and uh, so, but you're mostly on your own. Now EOS gives you a set of best practices, what, what's worked, what hasn't. The community is incredibly supportive. A lot of, a lot of like, you know, all the implementers are, former entrepreneurs who have had exits, run EOS in their own business, super smart, cool, helpful people. We live our core values. Help first is one of them. Do what you say, do the right thing. Humb humbly confident, grow or die. We live those things. By the way, you notice how I could just bring them up right off the top. That's how everyone yeah. in a company should be about core values. It should, it should come right off the top because you, oh, that's you good. Internalize them. You shouldn't have to look at the, the coffee mug to, to pull them up. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. But for me, I come from a background in enterprise sales. Um, so I, I know how to sell. I also was fortunate enough and I know how to leverage a CRM as a tool to help me manage that effort. I know how to sell enterprise, which is really what I'm selling because it's relational. It's deeply rooted. It's strategic. I'm not selling a widget, right? So it's all about building trust and really caring about the, what's in the best interest of your client. Um, and nurturing a relationship and trust to get to a point where they really, I mean, there has to be a lot of trust with an implementer and their clients for it to work. Uh, Cause they, they're putting a lot of faith and a incredibly important, you know, at the fundamental root level of running their business, their faith is, is entrusted into you. And so I take that responsibility very seriously. Um, it's a, it's a serious and awesome responsibility that I have to my clients. Um, LinkedIn has been a huge boon for my business. It's just a great way to develop a brand, put content out there, continually stay in front of the right audience. But man, there's no getting around. There's just a heavy lift. It's hard. It's hard, but I enjoy it. I'm good at it. I have a, a franchise community that I had a lot of relationships with that I brought into this business. And that, that was really, you know, the fuel that helped grow the business is immediately I had people who I knew, who I trusted, who I liked. And who trusted me and liked me, and, and you know those became my first clients. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, and I, I've seen you on on LinkedIn, and the consistency of you know just what you put out every day probably adds value. You know, over time, you know, I think people underestimate the like the small steps that one post, but when you compound that post over two years, I mean, now you have a library of content that somebody can fall back on. Right, it's tough to do. It, it that actually took a lot of discipline and it really developed my, my chops as a writer. Cause I, I tend to overwrite and, and like when I write, I write long form. And so writing on LinkedIn, two years of posting once or twice a day, you know, a thousand plus posts. 
yeah. uh, has made me a much more concise, you know, punchy writer. So it's, oh, that's it's good. helped develop me as a professional. So I got to give you another rose, man, because I gave you the one for getting me into this side of franchising and EOS, hearing you on a podcast. So that was the first rose. Second rose, you did a post on LinkedIn, and it would have been around the uh, fall, late fall or early winter of last year. And you just took a screenshot of your impressions over time. And for context for me, I was struggling with like, what does this even matter? I post this up, I get one like, but you had, you showed the metric of how you had just incrementally gone upwards in your impressions and how it was just a testament of consistency. And it was that day and it was that post that I personally made a decision of like, all right, bet there it is that's what i needed and ever since man i've fallen off a little bit but it's i i'm mean, i'm interested to see how this year is to the this year being 2024 compared to 2023 because it was the i had the full year now of content and it's crazy the connections i've been able to make the affirmation and just what i'm what i'm doing like it's working so again man i appreciate you for that because that uh that, uh, I mean, it changed the game for me, you know, and it, it's, I'm doing what I'm doing now because of that decision that I made then. So thank you. Oh, that's so cool, man. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I, I remember that post. It was my, after I got my millionth impression. There it is. And, and it just, it's just a testament to anybody listening. Just pound the rock. Pound you know, the rock. You know, you're, you're, you're out there every day with a sledgehammer and those first 99 strikes on that rock, nothing happens. And it's the hundredth strike that breaks the rock, right? So Man. it's all about putting in the work, trusting the, like we said at the very beginning of this, when it relates to goals, I, I prefer to trust the process. Every day, get it, do the, do the right things, do the things that you know are, are good for your health, your business, your mind, your spirit, your soul, your family, just keep putting in those reps and, don't worry about what's going to come out on the other side. Cause as long as you're consistent with that process, good shit's going to come out the other end. It's just yes, sir. Care of itself. Yes, sir. Man, I feel like I could, uh, you're a cool dude, man. I feel like I could talk to you for a while, but it is, uh, it's a holiday and I know your wife is, is <laughs> sacrificing you for this and mine, my family is as well. So we got to wrap it up at some point. Um, but before we do, I want to ask, what are, what are some things that you are uh, growing towards this year? What are some things that you'd like to see for yourself and your business? And as you continue to, you know, bang down the rock, you know, what are some, maybe some projects that you're working on, things that you want to kind of set up 2024? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I appreciate you taking some time out of your New Year's morning too. We're, we're going to go grab a little family brunch here shortly. There you go. So. But I've got nice. some creative juices flowing now, so uh, so I'll have better conversation with my family now as a result of this. But there we go. Um, growing more of my practice in Dallas. Going to do an event late March for Dallas franchise executives at uh, the facility. Propelled Brands is a client. Um, Fast Signs, Nerds to Go, My Salon Suite. So we're actually going to have an event for Dallas franchise execs at their training facility, which is world class, which is oh. going to be a lot of fun. Uh, nice. starting an executive coaching practice. So I'm going to pick a very select handful of, you know, maybe no more than five or six founders, executives to do some one-on-one -on -one personal coaching with throughout the year. Uh, I've been studying and training with a group of coaches to get me prepared for that. I will say that my wife and I run EOS as a couple. And so okay. I shared a story about how we created our VTO and it helped us live lives of intention versus reactivity. Well, yep. we also run L10s. Every Sunday we get a babysitter. Oh, that's Friday awesome. Night, but, but we realized how tired we were. So we get a babysitter Sunday afternoon and we have her go play with our son. We go in my office, hook up my laptop to the big screen and run L10s, IDS, create to do's, hold each other accountable for our commitments. You know, my wife and I, we've got a lot of goals and we've been it's just funny. We, we do, we do those meetings, but we don't have the structure and it's so simple. If you do it with your business, why not do it with your family? That's genius. Love we it. Are visionaries. And so for us without, without a tool, we'll come together and we'll talk for two hours and 
heartfelt, you know, decisions made and things we're going to do, and then we'll forget about it because we don't have a framework and we'll, we won't forget about it. We'll go back to la our lives. The water goes back to where it's flowing and then we'll come back together in a month and have the same conversation and nothing has changed. So having a context and a framework to hold one another accountable for the commitments we make and a clear action plan that we can agree and align on, it's changed the whole context of our relationship. So oh, that's solid, man. Powerful stuff, man. I definitely uh, practice what I preach in all areas of my life. Oh, I love it. Oh, that's really cool. Well, all right. Uh, hit me with uh, hit me with one final. What would you say to a person that you know? It's January first, January first, and you've got people out there that are either struggling to let go of the vine within their own business, or they're contemplating getting uh, changing things up and starting a business for themselves. What uh, maybe a word of encouragement or a word of tuning their their mindset in the right way. So how would you how would you facilitate that? Turn off your devices. Yeah. Close, close the laptop. Put the phone in another room. Get out of the box that you're in, and spend some time really thinking about what it is you want and why you want it, and be honest with yourself. Not about what anybody expects from you, not about what the world expects from you or what they think, what you think the world or anyone else expects of you, but what you want, why you want it. And once you have clarity around that, then architect your life and your business to support those things and keep them visible and in front of you as reminders to always orient you back into that sweet spot when you inevitably stray because the chaos of life and business will ultimately overwhelm everybody and continually create that time to protect protected sacred time to reorient, protect your confidence, get clarity, and sort of get back into that zone of you're doing what you want and you know exactly why you're doing it. So just have that honest conversation with yourself and only yourself and then let, let your inner voice guide you. That's it. Wow, man, good stuff man well justin i i appreciate you man for hopping on and uh i'm gonna let you get to the family but man this this was truly a value add for me and to the audience so i'll let everybody if anybody listening wants to get in touch with justin man just find him on linkedin but until next time stay humble stay hungry stay streetwise peace much much love happy new year let's go <laughs> <laughs> all right everybody that's a wrap Thank you so much for making it to the end. Hey, if this episode added any value to your life at all, please like it, share it, give me a five-star review. It's the only way that this show is going to gain traction and help more people achieve their dreams. If you're ready to start your franchise journey, visit streetwisefranchising.com. Let's set up a time to talk. Hit me up on LinkedIn. Until next time, stay humble, stay hungry, stay streetwise. Peace.